welcome friends to this monthly get together that we have in order to stay on track on our spiritual journeys we all have a spiritual journey within us some of us recognize it some of us don't the real reason why we don't recognize or recognizes a question of where we place our attention this whole life is being governed by our attention if we put attention on a particular subject particular area that becomes relevant for our life and if we put attention on something else that becomes relevant for our life if we put attention on our own self that becomes relevant the whole game is a game of putting attention on experiences outside i had a lovely friend of mine who just came from california and i had a meeting with her before coming here and we discussed something very interesting we discussed what is experience because people want experience people come to me we want spiritual experience we want to see how experience can give us a feeling we are enlightened how experience can help us to know who we are how we can experience our own soul how we can experience that all these statements that are being made by all the mystics saints that they are true what kind of experience is needed for all that so i must have surprised her a little by saying that experience cannot tell you at all about the soul about yourself or about any of the spiritual thing that masters talk there is a big difference in knowing who you are and your experience and when we use the word experience we are always using in relation to something that happens in time and space the word experience does not fit in with a state where there is no time and space when you whenever you want any experience it involves something happening time and space moreover to know who you are is not an experience is a knowledge of your state of being and that state of being can be even beyond the limits of experience if you examine very carefully what is the meaning of the word experience you will notice it's purely a mental experience it's a purely a mental function all experiences that we have are mental functions because the mind only operates in time and space the mind is completely useless if we are talking of something beyond time and space and that is why we are constantly searching for things with our intellect with functions of the mind and trying to get experiences of things which are beyond experience there is no time and space beyond the mind in fact why we are here to have a un unusual experience or to have experience per se is because we have a mind and if you look back at the history of evolution of experience evolution of life evolution of all the knowledge we ever had if you look back at the history of knowledge history of all that we know and go back where did it originate from it did not orig originate from an experience experience was an outcome it originated from what has been described as a creative power totally undefined it has been called anami nameless its original functions have been called agam cannot be even known a luck cannot be described how are these words being used for something that is the origin of all experience so experience is very limited the experience was generated so that we could have a totally new form 
of awareness in time and space. And that's what we have, we are having. Immanuel Kant, German philosopher, who had done a lot of work on the function of the mind, he comes to the conclusion that the categories of the mind are cause and effect. That the experience generated in time is the function of the mind. When he describes the categories of the mind, he very clearly says that the real thing to create was, in time and space, create events which become our experience and place them as cause and effect. You will notice this was a very big discovery that he made. And he explained, without knowing it, that he was explaining a very big law accepted in most religions, the law of karma. We all say, this is my karma, and karma is being defined as destiny. This is my destiny, I've been born with this destiny. What is destiny? Destiny is merely a collection of events that will happen in a life. There's no other definition. Destiny means certain events will happen and it's pre-written or pre-written or some of it we are modifying or what is happening, we don't know. But it is just a series of events. And those events in time and space are created with the relationship of cause and effect. If there was no relationship, they were all independent, there would be no law of karma at all. The law of karma which says, if you do good things, you will be rewarded. If you do bad things, you will be punished. And this law creates, because of the cause and effect relationship, it creates a resultant life for you, based upon what good you did, what bad you did. All religions of the world have accepted it, in one form or the other. All spiritual masters accept it. All of us who have gone through karma accept us, accept it that we know we are going through our karma. We are going through good and bad luck based upon good and bad decisions we make. Sometimes we make a good decision in this very life and we get a reward in this very life. Sometimes we make a bad decision, we get the result in this very life. Sometimes there are things happening in our life we can't explain. So we say it must have happened in a previous life. The law of karma has been expressed in so many ways. A Christian friend of mine, who was, of course, reading the Bible very carefully, always, and made me write the Bi read the Bible very carefully also, he said, according to the teachings in the Bi Bible, there's no reference to the law of karma. So, where does this law that you talk of, and we all seem to experience something like that, and you say all religions accept it, where has it been referred to in the Holy Bible? And I was able to pick up the right portion where a man comes to Jesus Christ with his son who is born blind. And he asks the master, Master, is my son born blind because of his sins or because of the father, my sins, the father's sins? He said, why would the father's sins be res responsible for creating blindness in the son? And the son is born with this blindness, how could he have created this? How do you explain? And if you watch the master's answer, he, will, he said, Jesus Christ said to that man, it is neither the sins of the child nor the sins of the father. It is that the law may prevail. And then of course the story goes on how Jesus interfered with that law. But the point is that he said the law may prevail. Which law? A law that can create a blind child? How can that happen? What law is prevailing that can create a child blind from birth, the law of karma. It has been described. It is described in other ways also. But this was a very telling way 
So when we say we are here because of our karma, we are here to have experience. Experience is only in time and space. But when we want to know who we are, it's not an experience. Who are we? We are who we think we are. Who are we believe we are? What do we believe? When we put this question to ourselves, who am I really? Is it the self in me? I want to know who is my self. The word self comes up. Who is my self? And Socrates, the Greek philosopher, was the first one who really openly said, know thyself. That's the secret of all enlightenment. Know thyself. And I want to share with you, with all the information and knowledge I gathered from my master, the answer is, to all spiritual activity, know yourself. Know thyself is the answer. If you know the self, not what experiences you are having, the self that is today having experience. The self that need not have experience. The self that just can be the self. It's an awareness of the self. Awareness is not experience. You can be aware of an experience or you can be aware of the self. That is having experience. The experiencer. Who is the experiencer? When we look at this question, who is the experiencer? We immediately look at what form do we have in which the self is operating. And currently, we have a human form, a human body. And therefore, we say, myself, is this body? Or maybe I am operating in this body. Little distinction. I can identify myself in the form in which I am operating. Or I can say I am operating in a form and distinguish myself from the form. It's up to us to figure out who is the self. This question becomes important to distinguish between the form and the self. When we discover the self that we are trying to think of does not want to die, does not want to perish, and the form is bound to perish. And therefore a question comes up automatically, is there something in me that will survive beyond this form, which distinguishes us immediately from the form. The moment we think, will there be something surviving after this form dies, is given up, this question creates the original seeking of something beyond the form. We all have it. Let me say, this is the spiritual journey to discovering who we are beyond the form. We all have it. And we all, at some point in life, think of it. Because we see people dying. Nobody stayed here forever. Great philosophers came. Great people came. In every field of, of knowledge, they all died. Great masters came. They all died. Saints came. They all died. This form is obviously a very temporary thing, then it is an automatic question for all of us, what else is there which we can call the self and is not the form? An investigation of that question is called a spiritual journey. There is no journey, we are not going anywhere. Some people describe a spiritual journey as if it is going from point A to point B. It's not a correct way to do, describe it. Point A to point B would be an experience. Knowing who you are is not an experience, it's knowing a knowledge, awareness. They don't go anywhere. It's just a sudden realization, I'm not the form, 
I'm something operating as a form. It comes suddenly. And that is why we cannot really call it a spiritual journey, but spiritual journey looks a nice language for describing we have to go and find out some other place. I think it came up because we liked holidays and vacations at different places and we go to our vacation, we take a journey and go to a nice place and the descriptions of our own true self, the descriptions of what our own state of being is without the form, seem to show it like a nice vacation place. So we think it's a journey, a journey to our own self. I would say that I am wearing a jacket. Supposing I began to say, am I the jacket or am I wearing it? I said, no, I am wearing a jacket because I can take it off. Will I say I have gone to a journey from wearing a jacket and not knowing that I am not wearing a jacket? Did it take time? Is it a, is it a function in time space? to know that you are not the jacket, but you're wearing it. It's an awareness, of course. It's some kind of awareness, some kind of knowledge, but it is not something that can be called a journey, nor can it be called an experience. It's an awareness. We have to distinguish between these things because most of us are searching for something with a tool which is not meant for that search. We are searching for our own self with the tool of our mind and that's not a suitable tool. Mind can give you experiences. Mind can tell you what experiences are. Mind can generate new experiences. Mind can explain experiences. Mind cannot explain who you are. That is why we're using a wrong tool to discover our own self. And that is why we can spend a whole life thinking about it. Thinking is a function of the mind. I remember thinking cannot take place in zero time, zero space. Because thinking takes time. No matter how short the thought is. No matter. There's something else that we also have which is not thinking and does not take time. But the mind will always take time because the mind only of only operational part of the mind is thinking. It thinks and therefore tries to understand, realize, understand, make sense of things, puts two and two together. This is a function of the mind and always takes time. And we are trying to find something, not an experience, but who we are, having an experience. And that is why the mind is a useless tool for discovering who we are. But there must be something in us that should be able to tell us who we are. This is the most basic knowledge because we are having an experience. Who is having the experience? It's a simple question. Who is the experiencer? Who has a form right now of a human body? Who is the one that is using the human body? A simple question. And the answer should come not from an experience, Answer should come from an awareness of who you really are and not the body. When we think hard, we'll never get the answer. And people are trying to get the answer by thinking hard. What else do we have besides the mind, which we now relate to the brain? Of course, brain is the physical function, physical organ in which the mind is functioning. Or just a physical organ. The brain by itself is just where the self is operating from. It can't become the self. You can't make any kind of an equipment or any kind of a form that you d design and it becomes the self. The self is the one that made it, the one that uses it. Therefore, the self that is using the brain, the self that is using the body, the self that is using and saying, who am I who is using the body? Who am I who is using the brain? This question comes up and we try to think with the brain, we never get the answer. Because the mind works in time and works in experience. 
not the experience. But there is something else in us which we can't really describe because it's not an experience. All descriptions are of experiences. There's something else in us which makes us know who we are. And it's operating. Let us see what is operating in our life. Do we ever have awareness, knowledge of something coming suddenly, spontaneously, without any time, and without knowing where it's coming from? Do we ever have that experience? I think all of us have. That's me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought I turned it off. Now, that's another story I was going to tell you, but a little later. <laughs> the Okay, this was another story. <laughs> Thank you. What we call that sudden experience is given different names by us. We call it intuition, intuitive knowing. Intuitive knowing has never taken place in time or space. It just comes. We don't know where it comes from. It comes from inside and not outside. Inside us, we suddenly know something. Sometimes they call it gut feeling. That just a sudden thought, not even a thought. Thought takes time. What word can we use? Awareness. A sudden awareness of something. I should not be doing that. Why? My mind says should be doing that. What is this strange feeling? Not a voice. A voice isn't a thought. A sudden feeling, I should not be doing that, or I must do that. Where does that come from? And we all get it. I have not met one person in life who says they never had this kind of gut feeling about things. In fact, they tell me that if they had listened to the gut feeling, if they listened to their intuition, they would not have made the mistake they made by following the advice of the thinking mind. As if that sudden feeling we get of some awareness is more accurate in, our, in terms of our destiny than even our thoughts. We plan so many things for our destiny, for our life, and so many things go wrong. And when they go wrong, we look back, I had the hunch, gut feeling, intuition. I should not be taking that step. I took it. Therefore, things have gone wrong. As if that intuitive hunch that came, that gut feeling that came, was more accurate in determining what we should be doing than the thought process that followed or preceded. Interesting point. If you examine very carefully your own life and say, how often do I get that feeling? And how often do we think about things, what to do? You will notice that when you are not on a spiritual journey, not on a seeking of your own true self, the gut feeling comes very rarely. But when you are seeking your true self, they come almost every day and many times a day. How does seeking create a new kind of thing like intuitive feelings? Where do they come from? And it's not only an intuitive feeling in the head, a suddenly feeling, I should be doing something or not doing something, or I should be seeing somebody or not seeing somebody. It's not merely in the head. We are driving our car, and there's a billboard using words which correspond to the intuitive feeling. Coincidence. How did this coincidence happen? And people who started their journey or on a spiritual journey or on a spiritual awareness, trying to find out who the self is, have more coincidences. I get reports every day. 
what is the link between these kind of experiences that we have while going through life in an ordinary way, thinking about planning things, and these sudden feelings coming up, sudden awarenesses coming up like that. What's the connection between the two? Very deep connection. Those who have had an awareness of the self, not the body, the self that operates the body, self that can be called life, self that can be called consciousness, self that can be called the power that gives us experience of any life, anywhere. If we can call that the self, those who have had experience of the self, and not of the form, have called it the soul. Nobody knows the soul. Have we seen our soul? No. Why? The soul is like our two eyes. Have we seen our eyes? No. We can see a reflection in the mirror. Nobody can see their eyes. We see. Seeing is all right as experience. But who is seeing is not an experience. Experience. So that is why those who have had this awareness of the self, and anybody can have it, it's open to all human beings. A spiritual journey or being on a spiritual path or spiritual discovery or discovery of the self is no other than discovery who the experiencer is. That's all. <coughs> For a time, it appears that there is an experiencer in the form we call a human body that was there before we were born and that will be there after we die in the physical body. It, it comes up, this kind of feeling comes up in many ways. It comes up when we start remembering things which happened before we were born. And we say that the mind doesn't accept it because the mind says, you weren't even there, how could you experience something? You're making it up. The mind is making it up. But some of these statements those people have made who experienced things before they were born have been tested out. There's a book published by Professor Banerjee in India, and he traveled all over the world looking at people, looking at children especially, who were relating experiences that took place before they were born. And they knew them very clearly. There were 2,000 such cases that have been listed. And all of them relate to a life that they were leading before they were born. And they give great details. The very classic case, this guy, Dr. Banerjee, studied was in Russia because the Russian communist government there at, the, at that time, <laughs> the Russian Academy of Sciences, did not believe that there's a past life, that there's a previous life. And yet this man, this philosopher or doctor, he was able to find one case of a young girl who was talking of seeing things in Japan which none of the family has ever visited. She was giving details of the streets names, street names and so on, of a Japanese town. So this professor went to Russia, studied that case, and said, I'll pay all the cost, and you come along and we'll take it to Japan and see if those things really exist, what she is mentioning. And that girl was taken there, and everything she had said was correct, as if she had lived there. The Russian Academy of Sciences were given this case, would you like to revise your opinion? Forget the communist government. They may believe or may not believe, but you are an academy of scientists. You should be able to study this case and see how can this girl, young girl, seven, eight years old girl, be talking of things which are not known to anybody there in that area and are happening in a country so far away like Japan. And the academy representative also accompanied. That's a stand big experiment that was done. And saw and said, yes, 
this girl is speaking of the things that exist in Japan. Therefore, this professor, a doctor, he said, obviously, she lived there and therefore there's a previous life. The academy studied this case and they came to the conclusion, this is not a proof enough of a previous life. And the reasoning they gave for dismissing the theory of reincarnation and previous lives, theory they gave is that when a person dies, all the cells are not dead. All the cells of the body, they dis dissipate. And they fly in the air. And there's a westerly winds that carry all those cells all over the world. And when the new child is born, those cells can be picked up from anywhere. And their explanation for this event was that those cells were roaming around of that Japanese person who died. And when this girl was born, her mother picked up those cells and they went into the womb and became the new baby and a part of the baby's memory and came into the head, the brain of the baby. So it's a proof of that some part of a memory of one person dying in one place can be born somewhere else, but does not prove that this person lived a previous life. It satisfied the communist government of the time. Today they are having rethinking on that on that same case. So some of these cases which I studied, which that professor studied, but there are so many cases where we find that people can describe something. Some people have been able to describe past lives under hypnotic suggestion. You, a hypnotist, hypnotizes the person and says, now tell me your childhood. And the person starts telling, I was a child, I went to school and I... And then as the hypnotist was, tell me more, earlier part, they began to, they begin to tell things that happened 100 years ago, 200 years ago. And they, they, they still a question, is the mind manufacturing all that? Or did they really live their past life? Now these are all experimental things we are doing here. But isn't it a better way that if we have a past life, to recall our own memory. Why go to somebody else, to a hypnotist or go to a scientist? What's the problem in our own life, in our own self? If we are wearing a body and sitting inside with a past life, can't we remember ourselves? Do we need a hypnotist to come and tell us? Isn't there a way, easy way to do that? There's a much easier way. And that's what I want to share with you. Much easier way. When you will die in the physical body, if there's another body, it will be there. It will remember. And simple. So wait till you die. After death you will know that you had a previous life apart from the one from which you just died. That dying was merely leaving off one form. You had another form, you had another form and now you died again. Maybe you'll have another form later. Simple. The only problem will be that you will know because you are dead. You try to tell us and we won't be able to see you or hear you. But no benefit to us. Can we do something that we can know now, not when you die? And the answer to that is yes. You can die while living in the physical body and have the same experience. Dying while living has been described as the method by which you can know this body is merely a form, another body exists inside it, another form exists inside it, or you exist inside it, the self ex exists inside it, you'll find out what the self is, you'll find out what you've been searching for in your spiritual search to you find yourself. So dying while living. In the Bible, Paul says, I die daily. It can't mean physical death. It means an experience. If we can die daily and find out who we are using the body, it's a big thing, big revelation. The method is very simple. Method is, 
simply pretend you are dead. There was a great Maharishi in India named Raman, Raman Maharishi. His whole discovery came of himself when he was very sick. He had an attendant with him. The attendant had gone to do some grocery shopping and he felt he was going to die. There'll be nobody around him. And then he questioned, why am I so afraid of dying? What will death do to me? And he pretended he was dead. He tried to stretch his arm. It will be rigor mortis. His body will become stiff. Then I'll, I won't breathe. He stopped breathing. This will be death. I seem to thinking better than I was not pretending to dead. I'm still thinking the same way. I'm still knowing myself. How can I be dead? This was the beginning of his search for the truth of himself. So, but he did a very crude, crude system of dying while living. But we can do a more sophisticated way. What is the sophisticated way? That we are conscious of this body because we are awake. When we go to sleep, we become unconscious of the body and we generate a new body called a dream body. Dreams are not in this body. This is sleeping on the bed. Dreaming is another body. But the self is the same. Self has never changed. You can't say somebody else was dreaming. The one who's sleeping was dreaming. The self remained identical, same, in a dream body or this body. So when we have a dream, we are doing things, wake up, oh, that was just a dream, just a created experience. Now we are in the real form. What did, what happened? How could we get into another dream body? By losing the awareness of this body, which we do every night. And if we watch carefully, how do we lose the awareness of the body when we go to sleep? You will notice that when you sleep, not many people notice, you just go to sleep. Some have a hard time sleeping, some have easy sleeping, some take sleeping pills, whatever you do. But you go to sleep and you become unaware of this body and a new body appears, which dreams, which goes in a dream sequence. If you notice carefully, that when you are awake and when you are talking to people and looking at people, the bulk of your conscious self appears to be in the head behind the eyes. You look at the eyes, you look and turn your head to talk to people and you know you have got arms and you've got legs and you've got a body, but you're looking and talking and thinking from the head through the eyes you are looking. It's a significant experience. When you're going to sleep, you lose that position. You lose the actual fact that you are behind the eyes, you start dropping down. When you drop down up to here, you're oh, sleepy, not aware, but still knowing you're in the bed. Drop a little more, you don't know where the body is. Little more, you're dreaming. Now this can be tested very easily, even tonight, when you are sleeping, when you feel very sleepy, try to touch your eyes. Normally, anybody can touch eyes, I know where the eyes are. But when you are half asleep or getting sleepy, try to touch your eyes, you touch your nose and you think you are touching your eyes. This process that takes place of a descent in the physical body, of something that is connected with your awareness of physical wakefulness, the very significant point that it actually drops down. And when it drops down and comes up to throat, you're dreaming. How do you know that? You know it is dropping down. You can find out. Anybody can find out. But when this drops further, you are not unaware. In the sleep studies that people were done by dream and sleep studies in the 60s when I came here, I found that if you touch the throat of a person in a dream sequence noticed by the rapid eye movements, the person would say, don't touch my eyes. The eyes had moved there. The way from where we look at, 
has moved there. It's a very interesting fact. Some yogis have a practice by which they can keep part of the awareness of wakefulness and then get into the dream state and they know how they moved. In fact, this is merely one of the energy centers of the several energy centers. We have six of them in our body and people have been able to put their attention on the energy centers and had different experiences. You can put your attention on the throat center. Just think of nothing but the throat and you have a dream right now. You can try it out. So these are different. The point I'm making is that the notional point of conscious wakeful state is somewhere behind our eyes in the wakeful state now. And when we dream, it goes down. Supposing we don't let it dream, hold the attention there, but do not let the attention go to any other part of our body. Just hold the attention behind the eyes, which is the notional point of wakeful state. What will happen? We we'll just think of that place. We just think, where are we? What is going on? What's the dark space around us? Where the light coming from? Where memories are coming from? How can I see things? You're engaged in talking to yourself, being yourself at a place behind these eyes, not losing the level in the body, not going down. And if you can do that for a while, what will happen? You will not know after a while where your hands are gone. Physical hands. You would be as if you are using your imaginary hands inside. Your imaginary, your, your imaginary self is sitting asking these questions. Imaginary person can turn around, move around and do anything. Dance there. When you are so occupied, the whole attention is fixed there, you begin to not know where your hands have gone, where your feet have gone, eventually where your legs have gone, where your torso has gone where the body is, that body is becoming more real, your imaginary self. What has happened? Instead of going into a dream, you are still there and you have lost the awareness of the body as you do at night in a dream. But you kept your awareness at the same level. What happens? That imaginary body that you are working with suddenly becomes alive. It was alive all the time, but you thought it was imaginary. It was imaginary in relation to this body. You are now unaware of this body. That becomes no, no longer an imaginary body. That's what you're using anyway. And you begin to remember things that happened to that body, not to this, before you were born in this body. What an easy way to find out that your memories of a state of being that were there before you were born in this body exist right inside you and can be simulated by artificially simulating a death of this body. This is called dying while living. Dying while living is a tested method of discovering that you are not the body, it's just a form, another body exists inside. So far so good. It, it revealed that the body is not you, just a jacket you are wearing. Only you are more aware of this jacket and less aware of that because you're not hiding in the jacket and there you're hiding in the body. But when you open it up, you have not really found much. You just come to find out that this body was not yourself. And the next question is, is that yourself? That's another body, another form. Can you be happy that this is what you found? Lots of people are happy. They say we found out our soul, we found out our own self. Now we know our soul came from another, another form of a human body or another kind of body. Maybe we were angels, maybe we were plants, maybe we were birds. We don't know, we are in different forms. Every form has a life and those life forms, we were one of them and we came now here. But we recalled some things like that. The truth is, that's also a body, a jacket. Inner jacket, inner shirt, not a jacket. We are wearing a lot of forms around our own self. And this is just a way to find out one form. If we go further, how? Same method, 
die while living in the inner body. What we did with this body, now do to the inner body. What will happen? So that inner body also, as you already know, when you imagine yourself, you imagine yourself exactly like you are here. Of course, you have little ability, flexibility to become a little younger or better looking. You're using your imagination. You can be a better looking younger person who's going in your imagination, moving around. But still a form similar to this. You never imagine yourself different than this. Some people can. Accidentally or by will. There was a Chinese philosopher who was able to, who, not able to, but he had a dream that he was a butterfly. I tell his stories many times. He had a dream that he was a butterfly. But he was flying in a garden full of flowers. He had never seen those flowers before. Those flowers were radiant with light. Colors were shining as if there was light built into the flowers. He had never seen those flowers in his life. And he said, this must be heaven. And I, butterfly, is flying around looking at these flowers. And he woke up. And a question came to him, if I was in heaven, I was a butterfly in heaven. And here I'm a human being. Am I really a human being? Who had a dream he's a butterfly? Or am I really a butterfly? Now having a dream that I'm a human being. He couldn't, he couldn't uh, clear this in his own self. He got confused. Because what he experienced as a butterfly was far more beautiful, very different, more radiant than what he saw in the physical world. So it was a serious question. Am I really a butterfly? So he asked his friends, his friends, am I really a butterfly? Because I was a butterfly in a dream. They said, don't be stupid. You are a human being. You are a philosopher. You are an educated person here. You can't be a butterfly. I don't keep on saying I was a butterfly. Say you saw a butterfly in a dream. He said, I never saw a butterfly. I never. I was a butterfly. I was flapping my wings. I never saw myself. But I was, I was a butterfly. Therefore, he came to the conclusion that the self, which we are thinking the self is controlling this body, is not the form of the body. It can take any form. It will still be the same self. That is just a limited experience. Some others have said, what will happen if we had no form at all? Would we still be the same self? Then you can experiment with that too. If you, any time in your internal meditative process, which I call meditation, dying while living is what I call meditation. The meditative process leads to that. If by any time, in any form, you meditate to a state where you find that you have no form left, you still be the same self. The self never changes. A great discovery. Self never changes. No wonder Socrates said, know thyself. The self never changes. It's only reality. All others, others change. Forms change. Experiences change. Worlds change. Everything changes. Levels of consciousness change. Self never changes. So that is why it's a great ability we have, a great potential to be able to discover who we really are, no matter what the form or formless we might be. So these are just forms. Why do we have so many forms to have different experiences? Why do we need experience? Because our true nature, which you will discover, if with this exercise of continuously discovering who the self is, becoming unaware of the form, we are not dying really, it's called dying while living. We are only simulating death at every level. If we can simulate death in the physical form and become unaware of our body and still remain the same conscious level, same operational level as the eye, eye center, we can keep on discovering that ultimately 
the consciousness but exists the self exists as consciousness consciousness operates of being conscious it's a being and therefore to be conscious it needs something to be conscious of starting out self and conscious of it is called experience today therefore somebody once asked what was happening when the beginning there was no creation and i said that's not the definition of consciousness that i know of in the definition of consciousness i know there was always creation because consciousness is a potential a running potential continuous potential of creation and therefore creation consciousness creator consciousness will creator creation will always be there together you can't have a creator and no creation you can't have a creator without a creator so therefore creator conscious and creation always have been there together so that is a very nature is there anything else i can point out about the true self which is i'm just calling it consciousness but the word consciousness has so many different meanings now mostly you being used by a physical consciousness of the physical world so therefore when we talk of consciousness of a self it is a difficult it's a difficult word not the right word exactly but it's the best word we can use if everything is contained in that consciousness i use the word totality of consciousness some people use other words like god allah ishwar parmeshwar they call different words for the same creative power i don't mind using any words except the moment i use one word i am isolating myself from all other religious beliefs i use another word i am isolating that means my language is very powerful i call it allah i am suddenly confined to one group i call it ram i am another group i formed so much power we have in words i can just change one word of my own creative power and i become part of a group therefore we are not part of any group at all groups are created by the mind here all groups are created by the mind their experiences here the self is not an experience it's the experiencer of everything that is why i just sometimes refer to the totality of consciousness totality of consciousness does it have anything inherent in it which trickles down continuously no matter what form we take yes it has at least three or four things have been identified very clearly one love originates from there whatever we are praising love god is love i hear every time people telling me i say yes that's true is an inherent thing in consciousness love is built into it it's the starting point intuition which i described earlier gut feeling hunch knowing anything suddenly without experience without using mind built into it appreciation of beauty built into it a state of such state of immense happiness that the word happiness doesn't suit and they have to invent a new word called blissful state bliss built into it these are just words we are using to show that even in the purest form of the self that we can possibly attain if somebody can attain still higher form of self i'd be very happy to go and study it but the purest form of the self has these things in it and they trickle down all the way to all the forms that we take then they get mixed up with the other experiences we are having for example now we have a mind which is also a body also a form Just look like it. Most people don't even distinguish between their consciousness and mind. They think consciousness originating from the mind. They don't see the limitation of the mind that does not even operate outside of time, and we are conscious outside of time. Intuitive feelings come to us without mind and without time. So that is why there are things in us which are beyond time, and that is why. mind itself has been called not only a body it's been called causal body 
if we want to describe these covers upon ourselves, apart from this jacket, I'm wearing a physical body inside the jacket. I am wearing a sensory body, astral body. Very, uh, uh, it's a body without matter, but all sense perceptionality. It's also called imaginary body, the one with which you imagine. All imagination comes from there, including our own sense of a body. Sense perceptions are all intact <laughs> completely. Matter is not there at all. It's a non-material sensory body, and we look at it as the same shape, but it can change into a butterfly, it can change into any form we like. The will inside that body can change its form. So therefore, there's another body. We call it astral body for simple reason. Astral refers to a sky. And the sky that opens up is different from this sky. This sky has darkness and light depending upon the sun's position. And that one always has some light and not a very bright light either. So in our imaginary self, we have that sky. Therefore, it's called the astral body. And the mind that creates all experiences, all 100% experiences, the mind creates, taking power to generate the experience and perceive it through consciousness. But the mind creates all, it's called the causal body. They use these words, they call the asthul sharir, suksam sharir, kaal sharir. And then comes the atma or the soul. So that is why these are all covers upon our own self. The final cover is so subtle, not many people have even described it, that when we find our own soul, there is a final cover on it. It's not visible like these covers. It's a cover which makes us feel we are many. It's a great cover. If one becomes many, one can become many in a dream. One can have a dream, you're meeting a thousand people, and you wake up and find it all, can, all thousand are part of yourself, that you made it up. Like that, you can understand it. But the one becoming the many is also a subtle kind of a form. The many is a form of the one. That we can't see it here. We talk about it here. We are all one. It means nothing to us. They say, we are all one, but hate that person. I like it. <laughs> what kind of oneness is that? Therefore, the fact that we are actually one and experiencing the many is a cover. And that very few people have realized. We have perfect living masters who have attained the state beyond the mind. And they discovered the real secret of the self is our soul. The secret is the one that generates a mind and then generates experience through the mind. That's our own self. They found the soul. And they found the soul and no birth and no death because there's no time. Birth and death are being created by the mind. Soul cannot have birth and death because beyond time. And that is why we call them perfectly masters. But they have discovered the soul. They say we all have souls. They teach us how to find our souls. The very few masters, very few great masters, my master used to say that their numbers can be counted on the fingers of our two hands. There are so few in this world who say even discovery of the soul is not discovery of the final self. Because you're still thinking of the many, and the many is a cloak upon the, on the soul, ultimate soul. There's only one. How the one became many without time space is not a division. It is in a state of being where there is no time space, and the one and the many are simultaneous. And that's the first cover of individuation. So when you look from the top bottom, there is one totality of consciousness. <laughs> existing in no time space. It is conscious, so it has to generate awareness. It generates awareness of the many in no time and space, no separation. Many are part of one. Why many? Why were many needed for consciousness? A rational explanation which mind might accept is that the one was love but not a lover, not a beloved, love. Many lovers and beloveds. 
love was the truth many were the practice of truth the actual practice you can't have a lover and a beloved if there's only one but you can have if the one is two it can be a primordial state it can be the generation of as many many as you like and that manyness that was first generated was actually creating an experience at that level of the one that then followed up with wearing more costumes upon ourselves to widen the experience and now the experience has gone that far we had <coughs> mental experiences causal experiences we put on more clothes and had costumes and found astral experiences and now we are wearing a third set of heavy clothes called the human body to so giving us a physical experience today we have a capacity to do any one of these experiences we like by dying while living which can be taught very simply through process of meditation meditation is nothing but the art of withdrawing your attention from outside putting it inside that's it and when you can practice that you can have all the experiences i have spoken to you today and all of you are competent and capable of doing it i hope many of you would like to practice it we will take a break now on some snacky snacky stuff <laughs> yes somebody told me i come to your meetings he said why snacks are good <laughs> i said welcome <coughs> we will put better one next time thank you very much i'll see you briefly again after about 3:30